All right. So we called it Don't Go to Hell because we wanted to keep it PG and sounding spiritual. So I was going to say, what in the hell do you want? But I didn't want to say that. So. All right. So I'm, I skipped past the stuff. If you missed last week, one of the beauties about this uh, opportunity is that I'm able to record it. So you can go on YouTube and Google my name. You can go on my website, whosoeverbelieves.org, and you can pull up the past videos. So um, we talked a lot about this last week. Are we saved by works? Hopefully everybody has the answer. What did we say? Are we saved by works? Yes no. or no? No. No. All right. So Jesus gives his life. Let's look at John 5.21. Stop there. I think I was right at this scripture. I, I didn't go back to all the other ones because I know me. I would have been stuck. So I said, I'm not going to go back. So let's look at John chapter 5. Let's start at verse 21. 5, 21. Yeah. 21 and 22. And then 28 and 29. Somebody want to read 21 and 22? I'll read. Okay. For as the Father raises the dead, and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. Verse 22, for the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to his son, to the Son. Okay, so we see two critical or important uh, factors there, which I've highlighted. One is that God, through his Son Jesus, gives life. And we know that when we accept Christ, he said, I came that you would have life and have it more abundantly, right? Um, and it says, uh, the son gives life to whom he will. And how do we get that life? Whosoever believes in him. And hence, hint, hint, that's how I got the name of my website. Um, whosoever believes. When I come to Christ and accept him as my Lord and Savior, the scripture tells me whoever has the Son has life, and whoever doesn't have the Son of God does not have life. So Jesus gives life, and then it goes on to say, the Father doesn't judge anybody. He's delegated, if you will. He's re relegated that responsibility to the Son. So it's the Son who will bring judgment or will uh, affect judgment, if you will, okay? Mm -hmm. What about the next two verses, 28 and 29? <clears throat> I have it. Okay. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Okay, <laughs> so... There are things that are going, there are things that we do, if you will. First of all, let me stop there. An hour is coming. Scripture tells us no one knows the day nor the hour, not even the angels in heaven. The only one that knows the hour of this is the Father. So when people start telling you, well, I figured out when the last day is and when Christ is coming, I hate to say it, but they lying. Because God hasn't revealed that to anyone. We had a big fiasco a few years back. People were all in a panic and a tizzy. This guy's taking out $100 million bulletin boards, talking about, what was it, April 21st or whatever that date was. He had all people panicked, worrying that they were going to be left behind, that judgment was coming that day. It was a really sad day when they went to his house and he was in there looking all sad and depressed. And uh, we were all still here. So when someone says Jesus is coming, here's what you can say. He's coming. We know because there are signs. We know we're closer today than we were yesterday. 
but we don't know the exact day nor the hour. So let nobody deceive you with that. And then it says that those who are, the dead will be raised. Uh, everybody's going to hear his voice. Here's another reason that you don't have to worry about missing it. Everybody's going to hear. When he lights up the sky, it won't be a situation where anybody will be able to say, oh, did I miss it? Oh, you will know because everybody will see him when he arrives. So we don't have to worry about not uh, being aware, if you will. But all those who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forward. Some are going to rise for one purpose. Others are going to rise for another. Oh, I done got to hit it myself. But let me finish this. And it says that in verse 29, those who've done good, and this is where deeds come in. Deeds don't save us, but they reflect our choices. If an apple tree start kicking out lemons, we're going to think something wrong with the apple tree. But if an apple tree produces good, juicy apples, then we say that's a good apple tree. Spiritually speaking, a spiritual woman who is a child of God will produce fruit that is consistent with that. She's not going to be kicking out um, sour lemons all the time. The, the caveat, of course, is none of us are perfect. None of us have reached or arrived where we always got it right. But there should be some fruit. When John the Baptist, let's look at him in um, Matthew 3, 10 and 12. Matthew 3, 10 and 12. Okay. Let's see, where are we? Okay. There's an even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. But let me back this up. I really want to read back. I'm gonna start from verse number seven. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming, well, he is John the Baptist. John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus. His mother was Elizabeth, who was an older woman, cousin to Mary, who was barren until her old age. His father, Zacchaeus, had gone in as the appointed priest for that time, high priest. His job was to go in on the Day of Atonement to bring in the sacrifice for the sins of the people. They would have to put a bell around their ankle because if they stayed in there too long, they would be presumed to be dead. Because if you didn't go in correctly, there was a possibility you weren't coming back out alive. So Zacharias went in and he got a visitation from an angel. And the angel told him his wife was going to have a baby. And he questioned it. Like, how is that possible? Um, and consequently, he was told, you're not going to speak until the baby's born, and his name will be John. So long story short, of course, Elizabeth gets pregnant, or well, six months later, the visitation is made upon the Virgin Mary. She now is pregnant. She goes to visit uh, Elizabeth, and John leaked in his mother's womb. He pre his presence, the Lord Jesus' presence in the womb of, of Mary immediately was recognized in the womb of Elizabeth. And so John left. So John was filled with the Holy Ghost even as a baby. So he was the forerunner of Christ. So here he comes baptizing what we call a baptism of repentance. That's a baptism where we're preparing our heart, but it's not the same as a believer's baptiz baptism because a believer has now accepted Christ. The repentance is more like I'm clearing my heart. Kind of like when we pray a prayer of salvation, we, we always should include, if we're leading someone to Christ, not only am I acknowledging that Jesus died for my sins, but I'm also willing to repent. I'm, I'm turning from the things that are not of God. And I need some help with that, but my heart is open to do it. That's part, that's the flip side, if you will, of salvation. So John is, if you will, think of him as the forerunner who's preparing the hearts of the people so that when the, when the real salvation salvation shows up jesus our hearts though their hearts would be read so in verse seven 
it says, but when he saw many other Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers. Don't get the impression he had a lot of good feelings about them. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, verse 8, bear fruit worthy of repentance. And that's what I was going to point out. When you look back at the scripture we just looked at, those who rise unto judgment are judged by their deeds because there's no fruit of repentance in their life. If you've been born again, there ought to be some fruit of repentance. Whether that's the way you now have an appetite for things that you never had an appetite for. When I got saved, I remember I was so hungry for the word, I read it like crazy because God's spirit lived in me and I wanted to feed him. And I didn't even know it from a spiritual standpoint or how to explain it. I just knew I was hungry for the word of God. I can remember when I cursed like a sailor and I had a nasty mouth and I would, uh, you know, bump my toe and if I said something, it wasn't something that, that was G-rated. Well, this particular day is how I knew I was saved. I bumped my toe and I said, oh gosh, I shocked myself. Where did that come from? That ain't the kind of stuff normally come out of my mouth. It was like the Holy Spirit had done a work in me that I didn't even recognize because he had a plan. He had a purpose for my life. He cleaned that up. I didn't have to go and say, God, help me stop cussing. There are other things that I had to pray more for, just like other people. I know people who were drug addiction, addicted and alcoholics, and the moment they gave their life to Christ, boom, that thing was gone. Others had to go through processes. Everybody's different. While I might have immediately seen a victory there, in other areas of my life, I might have had to lay before God and cry out for deliverance. Everybody's different. But in that particular instance, I said, oh, there must be a God because he done cleaned my mouth up. I knew I was saved. So there's a fruit of repentance. There should be some evidence. Speaking in tongues is one evidence. Doesn't mean everybody does, but that's one evidence. Peace, joy, love, tenderness, humility, all of those things that make up the fruit of the spirit, some kind of fruit should be coming forth. Desire to tell others about Jesus. When you first get saved, you try to tell everybody about Jesus. And they're like, oh, Lord, here she come again. <laughs> because you're so excited about the things of God. There should be some fruit of repentance in our lives. If we can hide that thing on a bushel, that's a challenge for me. Somewhere there should be some fruit. So verse 8 says, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children of Abraham from these stones. That will humble you. Because if you don't praise me, Jesus said a rock's a crowd. Verse 10, and even now the axe is laid to the root of this trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So those who are not in Christ, that are not bearing the fruit that reflects the spirit of God, cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. And this will indulge me a moment. This takes me back to when I first got saved. I remember reading that scripture and being so in awe of the Lord. Like I'm not even worthy to untie his shoe. What a mighty God we serve. He said, I'm not worthy to carry his shoe. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His widow and fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And we know the baptism of the Holy Spirit is one of those things the body of Christ doesn't always agree 100% on. But as a believer, we know the scripture says, once I'm born again, a deposit is made. The Holy Spirit comes to abide on the inside of me. Jesus, in fact, said he will abide not just with me, but he will abide in me forever. So that when we are in Christ, we get a baptism, if you will, some baptism meaning to submerge, to be surrounded by, filled with, however you want to call it, the Holy Spirit. And uh, 
water baptism, as I indicated, that John was doing was for repentance. So the key thing we see is with one, the key point here is where there's no fruitfulness, no evidence, then the only thing you do with that is throw it into the fire. A, a, a burnt up, dried up tree. You know, country people be building fires in their backyard, throw all the old wood and all the raggedy little pieces of tree and and all of that into the fire. It's just a, a natural example of what will happen in the spirit realm when we are not in Christ at the end of our age. And it will be, notice, chafed with unquenchable fire. In hell, that fire is never going out. We got a little glimpse of that when we looked at the story of the rich man and the beggar Lazarus. Rich man immediately went to hell, the scripture said. And there was torment. And he said, can, can you just let him come dip his finger in the water and cool my tongue because I'm tormented in the flame. It was torment. There was discomfort. There was constant agony. Scripture says there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So it's not a place to play with. It's not a place to be taking a chance on going. You don't want your soul tormented for eternity. You want to spend your life eternal with God in heaven. So here we are seeing the distinction. So we have two destinations. Two types of dead and two types of deeds. Those that are thrown into the fire do not bear good fruit. Those that are thrown into or gone into heaven are those who do bear good fruit. So those are two types of dead people, the righteous and the unrighteous. Two types of deeds, the ungodly and the godly. The fruit of the, the I should say the right hand is always God's. The fruit of the spirit, the fruit of eternal life versus ungodliness. There's two different types of all, both. So the trees that don't bear good fruit are burned. And John came baptizing with water, but he said Jesus was baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And that fire, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the believer, the fire, the unbeliever. Some have taught that differently. We're not going to debate that. The key thing is that if I'm in Christ, the Holy Spirit will fill me versus the fire that will await the person who doesn't have Christ. So Jesus will gather up his wheat and burn up the chaff. You know, you probably, um, I don't know nothing about wheat other than what I read, but when they, when they harvest the wheat, they would throw the wheat up in the air because the wheat was heavier. It falls down back to the seed, but the chafe is light, so the breeze would just blow it away because the chafe was like, think of it like the weeds that's gotten mixed in with your good crop. So you, it will just be blown away. But the scripture said he burns up the chafe. So if it's not of God, but notice that we're not going to get into it, but if you do a little digging, you'll see God always tells us, don't you try to separate. That ain't your job. See, we try to say, well, she ain't in Christ. He's a devil. She just, uh, you don't know. Because watch this. Read <clears throat> sometime in the first chapter of First Corinthians, and you'll see that um, unbelievers sometimes don't look any different from babes in Christ. Because they are both carnal. When you haven't been converted, when I say converted, I don't mean born again, but I mean in terms of your your actions and your attitudes haven't been fully matured into the things of God yet. To the naked eye, you look like a heathen. And so God has a way of cleaning us up, but it's a process that we call sanctification. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I'm just going here for a hot minute, so keep your finger where you are. But chapter 3, verse 1 says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. So he's calling babes in Christ carnal. To the natural man, that means they, they fleshly. They, they don't act like Christians. But notice, he's talking to brethren. He's talking to spiritual people. So these are babies in Christ who, if you looked with your natural eye, you know, man, she's still going to the club. I remember 
when I got saved, I was, I don't know, 13, whatever, 12, probably 13. Whatever I was, I was fairly young. And my mother's like, look like she's dancing more now than before she got saved. <laughs> she's like, oh, she ain't slowed down a bit. But she didn't know what was going on on the inside. See, on the outside, God's working on the inside so that stuff can change on the outside. But it takes a process, like I said, called sanctification, a cleansing. And so you got to be patient with people. Don't throw people away too quick. Because not that it's about me, but just because I learned to yield myself to God. Imagine how many hundreds, if not thousands of people whose lives would not be impacted with the gospel out of my mouth if somebody hadn't been patient with me. How many hundreds, of, if not thousands of women did I minister to at the prison and all over the world now? Uh, I just got a text from Victoria telling me another country where Finland popped in on my uh, app. That means that God is doing something but if somebody had thrown me away, didn't take the time, maybe that brother who just sent me the email doesn't get saved. Not that he couldn't have raised somebody else up, but God, remember we looked at it in Ephesians 2.10? He said, there are good works that he planned in advance for me to do. So I have to do what God told me to do. But if somebody had thrown me away, had given up on me, written me off as calm, discouraged me, maybe that man never gets the word that I'm supposed to share with him. So all that I'm trying to say is be real careful about calling out people not being spiritual and not being godly and all of that. Pray for folks. If they don't look like they're walking right, pray for them. Encourage them in the things of God. Talk to them. Ask God to give you a word to encourage them, to build them up. Don't tear them down because you might be tearing down the next vessel that God wants to preach the gospel through. In fact, the more ragged not to say you have to have a ragged but i found a whole lot of pastors if you look back in their background them jokers had some stuff going on when they were youngins but god and now they've translated because here's what i've learned the gifts and the call of god are irrevocable and whatever talents and gifts he put in you if they're not yielded to god you'll be messing around doing something else with them god give you the gift of exhortation Instead of building people up, you cussing them out, tearing them down. But when it's yielded to God, then it has the power to change lives. So I'm saying all that to say, be careful how you treat people. Be careful how you, um, you know, judge people. Be careful about writing people off. Because some of them very ones might be the ones that God wants to use. To whom has been given much, what the word of God said, much is required. And to whom has been forgiven much, loves much. So that person who maybe was the most wretched might be the very one that God will use the most to win souls. So I just share all that to say, we don't get to divide. That's God's business. In fact, it says the angels will make the separation. But he'll gather his wheat into the barn and burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. My goodness. Bless his name. Amen. Amen, Faye. Amen, Bessie. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> ah, look, I try to keep up with them chats. I ain't always good at it, but I try. All right, let's keep it moving. We're going to finish this in the name of Jesus. I hope. All right, let's look at Mark. So we've seen the witness of um, Paul, uh, John. Now let's look at the witness of Jesus. Um, Mark chapter 9, verse 43. Who can read that for us? Mark 9, we're going to read verse 43, verse 47, and verse 48. Okay, I'll read 43. Oh, Lord. Okay. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. Okay, you might as well do the last two. You're in the neighborhood. Okay, all right. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into ooh, hell fire. Chapter... 
let's see, verse 48, where their hmm, worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Amen. So, of course, Jesus is speaking figuratively, although there are nations where they take that thing quite seriously. If you sin, they will cut your hand off, especially some of the Middle Eastern nations. They were known for that. Your hand sinned, okay, off it comes. Thank you, Jesus. We don't take it that literally. But the premise is that get rid of anything that's causing you to sin in your life because the ultimate consequence is that you're going to end up in hell. If you look at even verse 40, uh, 43 that she read, it says, hell in, uh, to go into hell, into the fire that shall never quench. There goes that word again, never quench, never ceasing. Ain't no time out for a break. Ain't no Gatorade break. Ain't no halftime out 100% hell, unquenchable fire. We don't want to go there in the name of Jesus. Uh, and then in verse 48, again, their worm does not die, the fire is not quenched. So that person's soul will never escape hell if they go there. So we don't, again, want to go to hell. And uh, we don't want to play around. You know, people say, oh, you know, real hell is here on earth. Oh, no, you don't want to play with that, baby. There is a real hell. You might be catching some hell on earth, but you ain't seen nothing yet if you go to the real deal. So we want to emphasize this because, you know, back in the day, they called it fire and brimstone. You know, every Sunday they come and they preach, don't go to hell. They preach about hell and preach about hell. And people kind of got tired of hearing about hell. But there's a place for everything. I don't necessarily have to preach it every week, but every now and again, I think we need to talk about it because people will, will marginalize it as though it's not real. You know, there are people who, when they do surveys, who say, oh, it's not really a place. And they have come to a place where they only want to hear, like the scripture says, what their itchy ear wants to hear. But just like a diet of only ice cream is not good. A diet of only hearing sweetness from the Bible is not good. Yes, I want to hear all the promises of God. Yes, I want the excitement, but I also want the sobering truth because I don't want to be happy partying my way to hell. I want to know what's the options and I want to know what I got to do to be pleasing to the Lord. So I say all that to say, I'm reading these scripture because I'm purposely trying to drive the point home. You don't want to go to hell. There will be a place of torment. There will be a place where the fire is never quenched. There will be a place where your worm, your body, your spirit, I mean, your soul rather, will never die. This physical body will shed, but that inner man will live forever, forever, either in hell or in heaven. And we want to be with God in heaven, in Jesus' name. So this is Jesus bearing witness to the truth of what it is that will happen in the hereafter to those who reject him. So again, we got two destinations, two types of days, two deeds. So we get rid of whatever's bringing sin in our lives or whoever, praise God. Hell has an unquenchable fire, like we said, and the worm does not die. Ain't no escape pod. All right, let's look at Isaiah 66. Somebody who hasn't read Isaiah 66, 22 to 24. I'll read. Okay. 66, 22 to 24. Yes, ma'am. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord. 22 and 24, right? Or through 24. 22, okay. yes. Yes, which I will which I will make shall remain before me, says the Lord. So shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh come to worship before me, says the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of, of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm does not die. And their fire is not quenched. Mm. 
they shall be an ornament to all flesh. Mm. Mercy, God. My, my, my. Jesus. Again. Isaiah is often referred to as the little Bible because it, like the Bible has 66 books, it has 66 chapters. And there's sections that parallel with each section of the Bible. And this one, of course, parallels with Revelation. And God is showing us again. This is Isaiah speaking thousands of years before uh, Jesus was even born to talk about, uh, or hundreds of years, I should say, before Jesus was born to talk about what was to come. So we know this is a consistent word that God has given us, that there will be a place where we don't want to go. The worm does not die, and what? The fire is not quenched. Yes. We want to be a part of that new heaven and that new earth, yes. that reigning time when Jesus reigns forever. And so uh, we are, again, reiterating this truth. So again, There'll be new heaven, new earth. Every knee shall bow. I mean, you know that there's a time coming that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Amen. And I always like to say you can bow now or you can bow later, but you will bow, baby. So it's might as well just go ahead and get the practice in. But you will bow because he will reign. And there will be a place where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So we don't want to go there in the name of Jesus. Let's look at Revelation with a parallel in the New Testament. Revelation is 20. Y'all with me? Y'all quiet. <laughs> we here. We here. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So Revelation chapter 20, verse number eight, verses 11 says, verse 11 says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no place for them. There was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And that they were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Y'all do know there's a record being kept of every deed we do in the body. Woo, it is a record. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. And anyone I found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So when you look at this text, there's so much going on. But Jesus, who the Father delegated as the one who will judge us, as he said, or judge the unbelievers, says that he will sit on this great white throne. And watch this. The dead will be snatched up out of the sea. No matter where you died, where your body is, so to speak, it will be resurrected. One of us, us, the people who are in Christ, will be resurrected unto life, but they will be resurrected unto judgment. And I was looking at this, and uh, the term death often has been used di in different terms, different ways. But the word Hades, sometimes you see it um, translated as Sheol, but it has three meanings. One is death, two is the place of the dead, and three is the place of the wicked. And over time, as they evolved in writing the Bible, tradition had it initially that death was just the death of everybody, like a general, like they died, you know, so they would use hate in that general sense. But as time went on and the word evolved and the Hebrews uh, recorded the scripture, the tone and the uh, intent of it was that now when we get to the New Testament and we see Hades, we're looking at a place, um, somebody's got a squeaky thing going on, you might need to meet this. Um, when we see a place, uh, uh, the mention in certain scripture like here, it's not consistent depending again where you see this in the Bible, but in this particular instance, it's related to where the wicked are. So they died, but this is their final judgment, if you will. And so when they rise, 
Uh, they will go on to be judged for what they've done in the body, the evil deeds, and God's going to judge them and hold them accountable. And then the whole death, if you will, in Hades, all of that which makes up that cluster, you know, some uh, call it hell, whatever you want to call it, but it will be clustered and thrown. That's the second death. They go from death to death. The lake of fire, everything's going to be consumed. And so there, that will be an unquenchable fire that consumes even the, the, the uh, place we call Hades. So somebody looked at it, <laughs> I don't know, years ago when I was a young and in Christ, somebody tried to explain it. They said, uh, when you, no, Siri, I'm not talking to you. Uh, when you, these phones are a little too smart. When you, <laughs> when you, um, Somebody said, when you step on the roach, that's the death. But when you smash it, that's the second death. <laughs> Craziness, I know. But anyway, so there's just a, a, an eternal blaze, if you will, that all will be thrown into that have rejected Christ. And so when we look at this, the difference with us is we will be judged on deeds that we've done, but we will be judged for purpose of accolades, for, for uh, crowns and for laurels, if you will but not for death. And that's why if you look, it says books were open. And then another book was open, which is the book of life. So whoever's name is written in the Lamb's book of life, you don't have to face that judgment. Now there are some who think we don't even rise at the same time. You know, there's a debate in terms of the body and theologians in terms of how that transpires. You know, when Christ returned, do we just get raptured up and taken away so we don't have to deal with it at all? Are we in the midst while they get their judgment? Not a hundred percent agreement in the body. The key thing is we are not judged unto death. We're judged unto life. That's the most important thing. Whether it's happening at the same time, whether it's happening beforehand, uh, the martyrs who die in the Lord, which I believe George Floyd was a martyr, um, their resurrection is first. Uh, but the key thing is that we are not judged like the world. That's the main thing we want to be holding on to. And we are judged for purposes, uh, if you will, um, think of it like a graduation. Some are going to get that gold sash for the high GPAs and some <laughs> going to get you know, named in the magna cum laude then there's some of us who like, thank you, Lottie. So we just go have <laughs> <laughs> different means of being, <laughs> different means of being exonerated or, or not exonerated, exalted, or, so to speak, celebrated, but we're not being judged because what's the difference between us and them? It's not that we didn't commit sin. The difference is Jesus died for our sin. So we don't have to pay the penalty for our sin. We don't have to get up and explain, Lord, I didn't mean it. I'm sorry. Because when we get up, all we gonna see, all he gonna see is the blood of Jesus. Thank you. Somebody ought to shout Amen. right now. The blood of Jesus. Blood of Jesus. Amen. Covering me, washing me. Hallelujah. The cross Hallelujah. saving me. I ain't got to explain nothing. All I got to do is say Jesus. Hallelujah. Hey. Hallelujah. So I don't have to worry about that. But when I haven't accepted Christ, when I, I got to be judged on my own actions because I haven't done what's necessary to be able, amen, faith, to be able to be judged according to God's will um, in Christ. I'm saying I can handle this. I got it. Well, bless your heart. You have it. I will take Jesus for 5,000, please. Alex, come on, somebody. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. So Woo. their destiny is set, and ours is too. Thank you, Jesus. But Thank the good you. news is that until that day comes, this is how gracious God is. You can cry out like the man on the cross and say, Lord, remember me. Yeah. I'm sorry for my sin. I cry mm. for you now. Receive me now. The yeah. problem is too many people try to wait until that ninth hour, that twelfth mm. hour, and they don't know the day or the hour. So they maybe you have 
saying that at 11.59, you're going to get your cry in, but you didn't realize death was going to knock on your door at 11.30. Ain't so you need to be wow. ready now. Ain't no time yes. to come up, well, when I get old. I laugh when I uh, laugh. Reverend Carr, I don't know if you ever think, I don't know if this Margaret, I don't know if you ever remember the movie God is Not Dead and that professor who yeah. um, was challenging the students. And then at the end, I mean, it was like at the very end, they had witnessed to him mm -hmm. and he was able, like, I don't know how, but he was able to confess Jesus Christ is his Lord and Savior, like at the yes. very last minute. Yeah. It was really, and praise it God. Was that's, that's the mercy of God. The Amen. sad news is, though, some people never get that opportunity. They die in a fire. They die in a, a car accident. They die suddenly of a heart attack. They don't get that last breath or opportunity. So it's not a place to be playing with. Um, I was getting ready to tease uh, my girl Kersha works with me is on the line and she was telling me about her son and how he's a little boy six years old she said whenever they talk about you know giving his life to Christ he said then I gotta I gotta be good the whole the rest of my whole life <laughs> you know He's like, no, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> but then recently he said, you know what? I think I better get this thing right. That boy's six years old. If he got enough sense to know, ain't no time to be playing around. And everybody ought to know ain't no time to be playing around. <laughs> he said, yes to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Thank you, Amen. 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 Yeah. Praise him. Hallelujah. All right, so... Look at Matthew. See my little cute picture? Look at Matthew <laughs> chapter 25. <laughs> Jesus said he's going to make a separation. Matthew 25. Matthew 25. That's his name. Amen. Who can read? Let's divide it. Let's see. Somebody do 31 to 35. And then somebody do 30, well, let's make it simpler than that. Somebody do 31 to 38, and then somebody do 39 to 46. Who can do 31 to 38? I'll do it, Kathy. Okay, come on, Kathy. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food, I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> what you want? He's yes. going to 38. OK. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we? see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and gave you drink when did when will we when did we see you a stranger and took you in or naked and clothed you all right who can pick up 39 i can or when we or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you Keep and going. the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Mm -hmm. Hold up right there. So let's look at this. He said he's speaking to the people on his right. We know we think of God's right. That's righteousness, his right standing, his righteous right hand. What does he say to them? He says, these are my sheep, because my sheep know my voice, right? My sheep follow me. They will follow no other. And what do they do? They do what they saw me doing. They feed the, sh the hungry. They give drink. They give shelter. They visit the sick and they're in prison. Because that's what sheep do. Sheep mm. beget sheep. Yes. 
And how do we beget sheep? By loving others, by encouraging them, by being there for them, by blessing them, by letting them see the love of God in us. One of the things that's broken my heart, quite honestly, over the last several days, God has convicted me to, is looking around and seeing how much vile hatred and uh, discord there is amongst the people who say they're in Christ. Mm, we say we love yeah. God and we going at each other and, and the Lord says, not so. That's not the way I called you to behave as my sheep. That's yeah. not what I called you to do in the name of Jesus. Yeah. So I've had to repent. Lord, help me. Even though I want to speak what's righteous, I still want to be right. Yeah. I want to be holy. I want to be kind. So yeah. I had to even think about how I articulate what I say and make sure it's seasoned with salt and with the love yeah. of God. But there's something about a person whose heart has been changed. They can look at the downtrodden and feel a sense of compassion. Jesus always had compassion. Mm. That's why we go to different countries and help out. And we help out people in different states. And we help out people we don't know. Why? Because he gave us his love. He shared his love abroad in our heart. And there's an evidence. There's a fruit. And if I don't have any compassion, any care about anybody but myself, I might need to go back to the water and say, Lord, wash me again. Yes, amen. Because Ooh. something's out of order that I don't care about anybody's well-being but my own. Something's yes. out of order. Yes. Because yes. God always shows compassion. Go yes, through the scripture. Yes. Over and over you see Jesus filled with compassion. Yes. Filled with compassion. Over yes. and over yes. and over again. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Even amen. when he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, he mm. wept because Lord, he cared about them. Yes. So we are charged as his people to do yes. the very things that he would do. Amen. And you never know who you would touch. Yes. We're at a leadership retreat in Cambridge, Maryland. And I'm at a table and Reverend Harris, Walter Harris talks to everybody. He said, hi, who are you? How are you? How are you doing? Do you have a church home? Do you belong to a church? And then the young lady was talking and he said, well, we're from First Baptist Church of Glen Arden. And she said, when I was in prison, you all came and visited me. Yes. You gave me hope. Thank you so much. Amen. You don't know. You never and so, know. No. You right. never know. Amen. And she was working and she said, I'm working. I'm doing well. I'm taking care of myself and my family. Amen. See? What a blessing. And how many people will be in glory because we went and took the time to visit them? We never know, like you said. You never know. And this is what I learned as a prison chaplain. It's not just that person. It's their family. It's their children. It's their parents. It's their cousins. They touch other lives because you touch their lives. Yeah. So that thing has a ripple effect into the kingdom. So, yes, it's very important. Mm. Amen. All right, who's going to pick up? Where are we now? 41. 41, okay, go ahead. Okay, then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they, will, they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Hmm. Then he will answer them saying, assuredly, I say to you, in as much as you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Amen. Wow. wow. Amen. So, so we got the sheep, but we also got the goat. Mm. What they got? No food, no drink, no shelter, no nothing. They don't want nothing. They don't want to offer anything. Mm -hmm. My mom word got separated, but praise God. Anyway, so. Let's look at the righteous rewards. He said, we go into everlasting, uh, everlasting life. They go to eternal punishment. Notice that hell, who was it made for? 
Not the devil us. and his angels. The devil and his angels. It wasn't intended for us. That's not God's destination for you. God's desire is that you spend your eternity with him. Amen. Look at our rewards. Just a few things, Psalm, so I thought I'd share. Let's look at 2 Timothy 4 and 8. Oh, we got, are we doing good on time? Praise God. Look at God. This is Diane. <laughs> okay, come on, Diane. Second Timothy 4 and 8. Finally, mm -hmm. there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Amen. 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 Anybody love the appearing? Amen. Anybody excited Amen. about the appearing? Anybody Amen. looking forward? Amen. Guess what? He said, you have a crown waiting for you. Yes. Hallelujah. A crown of Amen. righteousness. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. We used to sing a song, I shall wear a crown. Yes. So Thank we you. are excited to know. Uh, Paul said, I've, I'm already being poured out like a drink off. He said, but I fought a good fight. And I finished the race. And I kept the faith. So there's a crown laid up for me now. Amen. So we have to endure some things. But God said, if you hold on, I yes. got some good stuff for you on the other side. Yes. Glory Amen. God. Amen. 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 Praise God. Glory God. All right. Who Amen. can read that? What's 1 Corinthians 9 25? Who hasn't read? Uh, this is Connie. 9. I'll read. Okay. Come on, Connie. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Amen. 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 So what does that tell us about our crown? It can't rust. That's it right. can't get old. Right. You, know, you, get, you get them earrings that are real cute when you first get them, and then after a while they start turning colors. <laughs> These are, this is an imperishable crown, baby. Ooh, it will never man. tarnish. It will never fade. Thank you, Jesus. Man. Amen. And finally, let's look at Revelation eleven eighteen. Talk about our righteous rewards. Who hasn't? Who hasn't read? I haven't. This is Ronnie. Okay. Um, Revelation eleven eighteen. The nations raged, but your wrath came. And the time for the dead to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Amen. So you see a clear distinction. I think she went upstairs. Come on. Okay. Wherever she went, bless her heart. <laughs> So we see a clear distinction between those who love God and those who don't. The prophets and the saints and those who fear God and those who destroy. We know the enemy comes to what? Kill, steal, and destroy. And we know he, those who are of him are destroyers. Yeah. God said, I got something good for you because that's not who you are. Amen. Amen. I have rewards. Amen. Amen. And that's a whole study you can do sometime. I didn't try to do it all because of the time. It's a great study sometimes. You just look up the rewards of the right. Amen. Amen. All right. But then there's the other side, the punishment of the ungodly. Let's look at Second Peter 3 and 7. Who can take Second Peter three and seven and two, four and nine, two chapter two, verse four and nine? I can read um, Second Peter. Okay. It's four and seven or three and seven. So you're gonna do two verses. You're gonna do three, chapter three, verse seven. Actually, it's three verses. Three, verse seven, chapter two, verse four and nine. Why okay. you hold? You get your finger at your place. Somebody else. Get to Romans 2 5. Who got that one? I'll do that one, uh, Reverend um, Letty Carr. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Shirley. Who got Hebrews 
10, 26 to 28. Hey, I can take that. Okay, Miss Linda. And then finally, Jude 6 and 7 and 15. Who can do that one? I'll do Jude 6, 7, and 15. Okay, so let's start with 2 Peter 3. Was that Kershaw that said that? Uh huh. Okay, go ahead. Stop, Alice. All right, so Second Peter 3, 7, but the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Okay. Then 2, 4, and 9. Say it one more time. It's second, what is it? Chapter 2, verse 4 and verse 9. I got you. Okay. I'm doing it on my computer, so I have to type it in. That's okay. Okay. Second Peter, chapter two, verse four. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to skip the nine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the, un to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So if you look at all those verses together, what you see consistently the word of God saying is God is preserving a day and he's preserving the ungodly for a day of judgment. So that day, just like he didn't spare the angels who sinned, he ain't gonna spare them. He knows how to separate us out and spare us, but he also knows how to preserve. And I didn't try to read the whole chapter again for second time. But these are two chapters I would commend to you to read through so you can get them in that context. When he's talking about the angels and the Jews, for example, how they sin. Oh, I have it. But the angels in um, Pete, Second Peter, how they sin, and he didn't spare them. So God is not going to give somebody a pass. You know, sometimes people convince themselves that, oh, well, somehow God going to treat me special. No, baby, the same word applies to you as everybody else. If you're not in Christ, you're going to deal with judgment. Somebody needs to mute because you sound squeaky. All right, who has Romans chapter 2, verse 5? Cheryl, I have it, um, Reverend Carr. Go. But in court, it would, excuse me, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So there's a day coming, and it's being stored up. You know, some think that God is a pump. That's my translation. But some think that he's not going to keep his word. But God is patient that his desires have none would perish. So he's patient, the word of God says. He's giving you an opportunity to repent. It's up to us to take that opportunity. But there is a wrath being stored up. And on that day, you're going to have to give an account. And if you don't have Christ, if your name isn't written in the Lamb's Book of Life, um, hold that question. I'll get to it, Nigeria family. Um, if you don't have your name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you will, sit, you will spend eternity in hell, okay? Who got Hebrews 10, 26, and 28? I have that, Reverend Maddie. Mm-hmm. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remain a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour, devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. 
So if you, in other words, know you didn't heard it, you understand it, and you still keep willfully doing your thing and rejecting God, then you just be just wait for the wrath to come. Now, at this point, you have basically snubbed him. You've heard it. He told it to you. You've heard it through his servants. And you just rolled your eyes and said, I ain't conforming. I don't care what you say. And what does it say? What's going to be waiting for you? Judgment. It says, no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. It's too late. Yeah. But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I don't want to have to deal with that. Mm. Okay, last one. Jude 6, verse 6 and 7 and 15. Jude 6, 7 and 15. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved an everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And then 15, to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them, of all of their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. My Jesus. So what do we say? Let's look at it. We said, first of all, the angels who did not keep their proper domain. Yep. If you go back and study, this was the question from our Nigerian family, if I got it straight. Oh. Because they wanted to understand uh, if it says how angels sin if they're in heaven, a third of the angels when when Moses or Moses Lord Jesus strike that when the devil when Satan rebelled against God, a third of the angels fell with him. They followed him. They were duped, just like Hitler had a following. The devil had a following, so they fell with him. They came to earth. We now call them demons. They're spirit beings. But they're no longer angels that walk with God. So they sinned against God. And therefore, they, can do it the right scripture now. says, hell was made for the devil and his angels. And that's what they're talking about. Okay. And, so, and Reverend uh, Carr, remember that there are two thirds that are still in heaven. <laughs> that's right. Doing God's bidding. And, and watch this. They ain't all in heaven. Some of them around here tending me because he gave his angels charge over me. I don't know about you. But he said he gave his angels charge over me to keep me in all of my way. He, they are ministering spirits, Hebrews 2 said, to, to serve those who are going to inherit eternal life. So angels watch over us who belong to God. So don't forget, if you ever get in a situation... Don't feel hesitant to say, angels, attend to me right now. Protect. Fight for me right now. The word of God, and in, in, uh, when Jesus was here, remember, he said, I could call down a legion of angels right now. So we have angels at our disposal. That's a whole nother teaching. But Amen. In this I like the sinning angels. Amen. And so... Amen. <laughs> They did not keep their proper domain. They didn't stay in heaven, but they left their yeah, so own abode. Out of heaven and so they reserved the heaven. The heaven. And then there are those who, if you go back in Genesis, I want to say around the seventh, ninth chapter in there, there are those who talk about how the angels slept, well, their theory is the angels slept with women and created these giants like, you know, oh. Goliath, the whole mm -hmm. generation mm -hmm. of giants. That's yeah. a whole other theory, too. But the bottom line is, like she said, there's some good angels, mm -hmm. and there's twice, twice as many of them as the you ones that said. Curtain, baby, or people are going to be looking at you sitting up in there. Uh, Shirley, you keep talking without muting yourself. Okay, anyway, so <laughs> I did it. <laughs> um, we're worried. Oh, in verse number 15, what did it say? Yes. Oh, no, not 15, number 7. I can't skip over 7. Cause see, we don't want to talk about this because it ain't politically correct. But he also <laughs> gives the example of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Yep. Look at it. The scenes around them. You remember Lot was there, how yes. the man wanted to sleep with the angels. Come on, yes. send the men out here so we can have sex with them. And Jesus and God said, enough is enough. Get everybody that's righteous out of the city. I'm getting ready to take this joint out. That's my <laughs> translation. The LMC translation. I'm taking them out tonight. Get your daughters, get your sons, get your wife, and get out. Because this joint is going down. Because he couldn't handle the perversion. What was the perversion? Look at it. It mm. says, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there's certain body parts that go together naturally. And there's some things that are just strange. And Amen. that strange flesh. Yes. God's Amen. Yes. Oh, man. yes. And yes. set forth as an example. So God has already spoken how he feels about that. Whether we want to accept it or not. I Amen. remember my pastor was saying, people say, well, I was born this way. He said, then you need to be born again, baby. Come Ooh. on. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, so good. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. And Amen. In verse 15, he says, to exegete, execute judgment on all to convict who are, all who are ungodly. ungodly of all their ungodly deeds lord yep. jesus so mm -hmm. thanks be to god that is not our legacy that's not our call that's not our purpose amen 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 all right so let's see here i know why you spoke about moses because in nine it says um, yet Michael the archangel when contending with the devil he disputed about the body and Moses that's not bringing against him a railing accusation but said the Lord rebuke thee right so angels uh, the Moses had died we don't know where God buried him remember he was up in the mountain don't nobody know where God buried him but the devil knew and, and Michael knew the archangel Michael who fights for us and and rather than dispute with the devil, he just said the Lord rebuked it. Amen. Amen. And that's a powerful prayer. The Lord yeah. rebuked you. The Lord rebuked you. I love it. Yeah. That's one of my favorites. <laughs> All right. We out of time. Any questions? Yes, I, I have a question about last week's uh, class. I forgot about it and I missed it because of all that's going on. Do we have notes from that one? So go on my website, whosoeverbelieves.org, and pull it up. It's part one about hell. It just says the same thing, um, just part one. Okay, thank you. All right. Any other questions? Or you can also look on YouTube. It's on YouTube, too. Oh, Any okay. other questions? Do you, have, have, a, um, do hmm? you have a reference verse for... Um, Satan and the angels who fell from heaven or yeah that's in Revelation I want to say 12 hold on any other question while I'm looking that up uh, well we say that God draws uh, all men to himself mm -hmm. when we say that there is a time and a place that he draws us or is he always drawing us? So, I mean, it's God's will that none should perish. So, I mean, I believe God is always wooing us. But I think, just like right now, I don't believe God put a pandemic in the earth. Amen. But I believe God uses the pandemic, uses Amen. the opportunity to touch our hearts and uses mm -hmm. circumstances in our lives. Oftentimes when we're in crisis, God will use that as an opportunity to get our attention, so to speak. And then from there, the Holy Spirit wooing and drawing and letting us feel his love will pull us to himself. Um, so in Revelation 12, verse 7 says, A war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in, he in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angel was cast out with him. Amen. Thank you. And 
there's a place that says a third of the stars. Wait, I thought it was in here, but maybe. But anyway, that gives you a part of what I'm talking about. And the third, I'm going to have to look it up real quick because I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, where it references a third is... Uh-oh. In but Genesis, anyway, um, it's hmm? Genesis 3, 1. Uh, so in Genesis uh, 1, 31, Satan rebelled and was cast out of heaven. How mm -hmm. you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. But this is the chapter I'm talking about right okay. where I was reading in chapter 12 of Revelation. I thought it was 12. I just didn't read it. That's 9. Look at verse Four. It says his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven. That's the reference that we go by. Okay. When we talk about a third of the angels typically and a third of them um, to the to the earth. So um, that's typically where we get the concept that a third of them followed him and fell to the earth with him. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, so any other questions? All right. So anybody want to give their life to the Lord Jesus? Um, today is the day of salvation. One of the things I've learned about God, like somebody said, he's always pulling. He's always wooing us. He's always um, desiring to draw us near to him. And he um, uses... The scripture says the foolishness of preaching, but he uses vessels who are incomplete because we are not whole yet. We're being made whole in him just like you are. But he uses us to share his good news. That if you give your life to Christ, if you will say yes to the Lord, then you will be saved. You won't have this eternal destination of hell. You will spend eternity with God in heaven. How does that happen? Because when you accept Christ, he becomes the mediator. He becomes the one through which you get a relationship with the Father. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man could come to the Father but by me. So when I accept Christ as my Savior, you can think of it like in the natural. If I went to Spain and I couldn't speak Spanish, I might have an interpreter who could make my words then turn to Spanish so that they could speak on my behalf to the other person. So in the spirit realm, if you will, Jesus is that interpreter. He's the mediator. He's the one who goes between us so that he draws us to, to the Father through his very death on the cross. The wages of sin is death. So he died in our place. He took our sins for us. If we accept him, then instead of standing to be judged like the unbelievers, we don't have to be judged. Instead of seeing that sin, God sees the blood of Jesus that was given for us. So we no longer have to face judgment. We aren't treated as our sins deserve. Thank you, Jesus. So I want to invite you, if you've never accepted Christ or would like to rededicate your life to Christ, somebody might feel like, you know what? I realize I got off track. I, I knew I did accept him, but I've been doing my own thing. I invite you to rededicate yourself to the Lord. Let's pray this simple prayer together. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe you died for every one of my sins. I believe you died for every one of my sins. I believe you were buried. I believe you were buried. And God raised you from the dead. And God raised you from the dead. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart and take control. I'm to and take control. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. I repent. I repent. And I turn to you. And I turn to you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. What the word Hallelujah. of God says is whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you prayed that prayer, your name is now written in a land book of life. Thanks be to God. 
when you rise, you will rise unto life with eternal, with Christ Jesus. And if you want to share that good news with me, you can share that, send me an email, you can text me, you can say it right now, whatever you want to do. I just want to encourage you to stay in the hands of God, meaning stay in your word, stay connected in the word of God through study, through seeking his faith. Um, praise God. We got two people just gave their life to Christ in Nigeria. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Welcome Hallelujah. to the family, Frida and Ken. We praise God for you. Man, hallelujah. See, Dr. B, you're not the only man in the house. Hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. So, Frida and Ken, your names are now written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You are a child of God. Amen. We welcome you to the family of God. And God mm -hmm. loves you, and so do we. And we know Amen. that he's going to do a work in your life. Yes. And we encourage you to stay in the Word. Stay close to the things of God. If you want to learn more, uh, get in a good church. But we're here to support you. My website is whosoeverbelieves.org. We got lots of material there, things you can look up. But also, you can shoot me an email, Rev Letty Carr at whosoeverbelieves.org. I'll be glad to do whatever I can. You got good folks over there with you, too. So I know you're going to hear what you need to hear. Know that I love you and uh, praise God for you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Mm, Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> God is good. So, just a reminder. If you want to look up anything uh, regarding what we have in terms of um, some of the older taste preaching, all that kind of stuff, you can look up um, on my website. We would love for you to download the app. Here's the beauty of this thing. Uh, God has blessed us to be able to have not only the website, but it's really three different things. You can download the app. The app kind of like group me. You can have little groups with your family, your friends, whoever you invite. You download it. You can post things on there, read stuff that we post and share. I actually created a Women Connecting with Christ group on there. If you join that, the beauty of that would be times like if something happened, I'm going to be late or not late necessarily, but counsel. Like we had to counsel it, uh, for the holiday. Well, people were emailing, are we having class? Whereas if I was having you guys in the app, I could have just shot it, just a reminder, hey, we're not in class tonight. So um, if you have questions, that would be a good place you can reach out to me as well. We have the mobile. That means you can go on your phone and pull it up, just like you do um, other websites. And it has a little more to offer than the app. The app is limited, obviously, because it's an app, but it ha does have reference to a lot of things. But it, you get more with the mobile. And then the full website, you get even more. So it's like um, the three little bears. You got the little chair. You got the middle chair. You got the big chair. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. But I would love for you to join and uh, be able to link in right there. And when we do that, that means that you can pull that up each week and boom, come right into the class. You can also use it to connect to the 316. We do prayer every day at 316 p.m. Still, God hasn't released us from that because people are, um, are you know, still dealing with this thing. So until he says stop, we're going to keep going. And we just got to know, it says 10 in attendance due to the lockdown. Because of the Nigerian, like us, they can only have 10 in a place at a time. So out of the 10, we got two that gave their life to Christ. That's not bad. Praise God. Amen. Amen. And then they show it over and over during the week. So we've been getting notices that people have been giving their life to Christ during the week. So God is really moving. And we are so grateful for those who serve there, Michael and the others who serve to facilitate this. That's the blessing that we have. One of these days, we're going over there and hang out with the Nigerian family. And we have a Holy Ghost party man. <laughs> All right. Well, that's my infomercial for the night. And uh, I pray that something blessed you and encouraged you through the word today. Uh, we're going to close out with prayer. Anybody have a prayer request? Okay. 
But well, let's go to the Lord. Father, we bless your name. We thank you, oh God, for your great and faithful uh, way. You are loving, you are kind, you are compassionate. Indeed, you don't treat us as our sins deserve. We thank uh. you, God, that one day we shall wear a crown in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. That one day we can celebrate when Jesus comes back to get us, oh God. One day, God, we look forward to. But in the meanwhile, we thank you that even here on earth, you have decreed that we can have heaven here on earth as we invoke and invite your presence. So help us to daily and mindfully say, your will be done on earth, Father, as it is in heaven. Let your divine will be done in each life represented here, each family represented here, each community represented here, God. Let your divine will be done. Let heaven invade earth we pray yes. in the mighty name of jesus we plead the blood of jesus across the earth realm god that your mm -hmm. will be done in every nation father bless us to be on one accord bless us to walk in love one with another we need your name we need yes. your presence if we never needed you before father we need you now yes. so bless us as we leave this place recognizing that we will never leave your presence it's in jesus name we pray father amen and amen. 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 All right, amen. ladies. Amen. God bless you. I enjoyed hanging out with you all as usual. Thank you. you Thank you so much. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Good night, everybody. Good night. 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 have a good night. All Thank right. you. You too, Reverend Letty. Thank, Thank you. Reverend Letty. All right.